A very limited critical acclaim. Had nothing of the kind of attention that are given to them now. She was not a successful author in the way that we think of successful authors now. She did not sell well. She was not considered to be a particularly good author, although some people, in particular Walter Scott, who's a famous Scottish novelist, gave her very favorable reviews. The future king, George IV, was said to be an admirer of her works. But there was no way in which, in her time, Jane Austen was the Jane Austen that we think of her being now. She, she made no money. She made, she sometimes made money. Um, she made, particularly on her early novels, she did fairly well. Um, eventually, one of her novels was republished and actually lost a pretty good amount. It wiped out almost all of the profits that she made on her other novels. Um, so it was very difficult to tell. She, she did well enough that she eventually was able to get a contract from a fairly established London publisher, John Murray, um, very well known as a literary publisher in early 19th century England, uh, but her novels with him did very badly. And if she had lived longer, she probably wouldn't have been able to continue to publish with him. So again, sort of very limited commercial success. Um, nothing like um, the appeal that she has now. A lot of this has to do with the literary scene of the early 19th century. There was a lot more interest in sort of controversial poets like Lord Byron and Percy Shelley than there was in an anonymous, presumably female author like Jane Austen. Um, a lot of her works were very common in the 18th century, or at least were thought to be very common. Um, she wasn't considered to be distinguished until much later, pretty much the 20th century, actually, as a matter of fact. And I'm going to talk about that more in a second. Um, really, Jane Austen's fortunes changed in 1870 with the publication of a biography by her nephew, James Edward Austen Lee, and this really increased her visibility in English literary culture. And I think his representation of what she was like is very interesting for us. Um, he set the tone by talking about Austen's life in this way. He said, quote, of events, her life was singularly barren. He also refers to her as dear Aunt Jane. So this notion of Austen as an almost auntish, maidenly, even spinsterly kind of writer really started to develop in the 1870s with this biography. And it wasn't really until the 20th century that Austen became really firmly entrenched as an English author of genius. And a lot of that is largely because of academics who took her popular appeal, and there was some popular appeal, primarily as a female novelist directed towards women readers, took that popular appeal and combined it with some of the very sophisticated things that she does with narrative technique and with some of her, what were considered to be subversive representations of women's roles in late 18th and early 19th century. That's really the thing that started to make her quite popular in academic settings and expanded that popularity outward from there. And I think that's something that's changing yet again. I think her position in culture is changing yet again, particularly with the kind of adaptations that I'm going to show later in this talk. Um, Jane Austen is probably as popular now and has as wide an appeal as she ever has had. Um, and there's, I think, a lot of reasons for that that we can talk about more later. Um, so you can think of her now as sort of an origin for academics like me, and this entire industry around Jane Austen. Constant production of papers, of conference papers, of articles, of books about Jane Austen, um, of groups like this that are actually interested in reading Austen's work, and also film producers um, who see Jane Austen now as a screenwriter extraordinaire, a, a gold mine for, for box offices. Um, and again, we'll talk about that in a second. And this is really interesting to me, because when you think about the content of Austen's novels, you might not think that they have this kind of massive success or appeal. Um, that's because Austen's novels deal with a very specific and narrow segment of British country life. Gentlemanly country families, gentlemanly country families like her own, that we would now think of probably as upper middle class or lower upper class professional families. These are the backdrop for, for Austen's novels, the estates and the money interests of the English countryside, and also the manners and the etiquette that relate the members of these families together. So money is really significant to these novels, and I want to talk a little bit about money right now. Um, and I'm going to use, and throughout I'm going to use examples um, of Pride and Prejudice. Just out of curiosity, how many people have read Pride and Prejudice before? Have some familiarity with it. 
Wow, okay, a lot. Um, I was hoping for that. So you'll know some of the examples that I'm talking about. So the Bennett family, which very curiously is, and when you see Becoming Jane, you'll get some sense of this. The Bennett family becomes the model for Austin's own family which is a very interesting decision for the film to make. It has a lot of ramifications, and again, we'll talk more about that in a second. But the Bennett family um, is reported to have an income of 2,000 pounds a year from their estate. Now, 2,000 pounds a year is quite a considerable amount of money in the late 18th century, which is generally regarded to be the moment when most of Austen's novels are set, even though they were written about 10 years, revised 10 years later than that. Um, 2,000 pounds is a significant amount because a gentleman could live a very comfortable and leisurely life on about 150 to 200 pounds a year. In the mid-18th century, a family, the average family income was about 40 pounds a year. So the Bennett family is fairly wealthy. Um, Mr. Bingley, who has 4,000 pounds a year, is enormously wealthy. <laughs> Mr. Darcy, who has 10,000 a year, we learn at the very beginning of Pride and Prejudice, 10,000 a year makes him among the wealthiest men in all of England. How yeah. did everybody know how much money everybody else had? In, in Pride and Prejudice, it gets reported very quickly. Um, but how? How would they know? Yes, how, how did that word get around? Um, rumor, gossip, um, reporting. Very well known. Um, money is significant for Austen's novels, um, and you know the way in which it actually circulated in life. Typically, what this would come from is interest um, in the funds. You'd invest money in the funds, the governmental funds, and they pay an interest, and that interest rate was five percent a year. Um, so when you put money in the funds, you got that income out of it. Um, and as I'm going to talk about more in a second, for people like Bingley and Darcy, that's not, and even the Bennett family, that's not necessarily where the money comes from. It comes from the produce of the estate. It comes from land, which is a very significant thing for Austin's novels. Uh, but the way in which people knew about it was constantly about rumor and gossip. Um, and it, but it's a kind of rumor and gossip with incredibly high stakes. Um, if you're interested in attaching yourself to this family, you want to know not just how much money they have, but where it comes from, how secure it is, because that's going to matter for your choices. Um, that's something that's often not discussed in a novel like Pride and Prejudice. Um, Elizabeth attaches herself to one of the wealthiest men in England. Um, it's an incredible change of fortune for her and her family, as the novel reports, but one that Austen deals with in very interesting ways. Um, as I was saying, most of this money came from land and from agriculture. Um, the economic changes that we talk about now as the Industrial Revolution were underway in late 18th and early 19th century England. Um, but more significant was a revolution that came before it, something that is now talked about as an agricultural revolution. Changes that go on in plowing, in seeding, and also in the enclosure of common lands. Now, enclosure is a term that's used to describe a very long historical process. A historical process about taking public lands and making them private. And a lot of people have argued that this is about the creation of private property. Enormous ramifications in 8th, 17th and 18th century England, but also visual ones as well. You know that scene that you get of England and the green fields and then the hedgerows, those perfect squares of hedges? That's a product largely of enclosure. Those hedges were actually put up to show people, this is my land, and you can see the boundaries of it. So that very typical English scene is a result of a long economic process that was about taking land that everybody could hold and making it private, saying, I own this. Um, massive ramifications because people who increasingly could use those lands to make money now became wage earners. Um, so all of these changes that are going on that are really enormous, changes from feudalistic ways of life with serfs and vassals to capitalistic ways of